Live from Union Square in the heart of San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering Spark Summit 2016. Brought to you by Databricks and IBM. Now, here are your hosts, John Walls and George Gilbert. Welcome back here on theCUBE. I'm John Walls along with George Gilbert as we continue our coverage here of Spark Summit 2016 at the Hilton Hotel here in San Francisco. Uh, continuing with our guest, Yaron Haviv, who is the founder and CEO of Aguazio, Israeli-based company, who is having a big day, which we'll get to in just a moment. Uh, Yaron, thank you for joining us. Welcome. Nice to have you here. Yeah, nice Aguazio. What, I mean, an unusual name to say the least, right? I mean, so, first off, before we get to what you do, what's the origin of the name? From, yeah, what's up with that? So when you think big data, you know, you could think about streams, huge streams of water, you know, high volumes. When, when we thought as the team of founders about this, so what is sort of the biggest, nicest waterfall that exists? And that's Iguazu Falls in Brazil and Argentina border. Giant waterfall in Brazil. It's, it's even nicer than Niagara Falls, and that's sort of the, the inspiration. Uh, after we found the name, we actually learned that it stands for big data in Portuguese, a big, big water in Portuguese. So that's why the I.O. for it. So we're like the big uh, data thing, dealing with massive amounts of data and volume. Interesting. Yes. All right, so yeah, so for our viewers who, who are obviously, uh, I'm sure, not familiar with Aguazio because you've been in stealth mode until today. Yep. Um, tell us uh, about you know, your, your core focus then. Yeah, so first, uh, a little about the team. So we're coming from a rich enterprise background. You know, one of my co-founders founded a company called Extreme IO, which is now EMC and sort of their uh, main product. Uh, we're coming from other companies doing networking, security, and uh, enterprise storage. So we have very uh, rich uh, heritage. I was in uh, a company called uh, Mellanox, selling to cloud providers and, and storage and enterprise, uh, dealing with all their uh, data center architectures. And what we're delivering is basically a new platform for uh, which unifies all those different use cases for. Uh, for data, and uh, you know, maybe we can talk about some of the check. Why do we have to uh, build those systems? And uh, when when you look today at the applications in the in the new world, you're you're sort of seeing the shift from uh, on-prem analytical applications to systems of engagement. You know, the Ubers, the Capital Ones, you know, Progressive. Everyone is getting into those systems that interact with users, interact with mobile, with social. You know, so they feed a lot of data. So let's assume you need to build an Uber-like application for your application, one that engages with the mobile and social and everything. You need to feed a lot of data. So what do you do? You go, and uh, I think George referred it to the zoo, you know, with those uh, 28 different projects. And one of the biggest challenges in those projects is not necessarily the application, those are typically stateless, is how do you store the data? And you have for every kind of data pattern that exists, you know, for streaming, for a key value, for files, for objects, and even for those you have different kinds for scale and performance, you have a different type of repository. And you have to go and use all those different uh, tools, like you go and stream and store streams in Kafka, and then you move it to HDFS. And some people say, you know what, let's also store it in Cassandra or HBase, and maybe uh, we need Elasticsearch because we may want to index it. So you end up with so many independent projects. Each one of them has its own sort of high availability, its own security, its own version management. Some don't even work together, you know? And let's assume you're an enterprise, and now you want to build configuration management. You want to do an upgrade for this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like your traditional solution. So we're trying to address this this challenge, w would you concur? You know, it's funny, I'm listening to how you describe <coughs> it, and the classic um, life cycle of a platform is take a bunch of disjointed, mm -hmm. partially complete um, sets of functionality and bring them together into a complete whole that is now simple enough and comprehensive enough for others to build on. And, you know, I, I sort of joke around and say <coughs> that, you know, many of the open source projects that are part of the Hadoop ecosystems are kind of like the Noah's Ark, you know, that <laughs> we, we, but not, they, they sort of join not two by two, three by three. Um, and we do, we're, we're in crying need for some simplification. And as we've talked before, Spark simplifies the compute, you mm -hmm. know, area. 
all those gazillions of different execution engines now exactly, yeah. you know, coalesce around Spark <laughs> or, or get consumed by Spark. And there was a crying need to do something here at the storage layer. Yeah, so exactly. So Spark Besky replaces the Mahout and the pigs and the hives and all those different uh, computation problems. And we're trying to consolidate all the data, all the persistency layer. Basically how you store all those sort of uh, files and streams and objects. And what's really unique about uh, our solution is that we don't just consolidate, we virtualize the services. That's why we call it virtualized data services. So you can actually stream data into the system on one end, uh, you could add sort of uh, the context. Let's say uh, an IoT example, okay? So I have my sensor streaming data. I also need to know the state, you know, what's going on with this uh, sensor. We can also pull it from the state, uh, which is more like a key value structure, and push it into Spark, a sort of one data frame construct. So now you avoided all those different data copies and silos and complexity, and you get real time. Within a millisecond from the minute this event arrived, you can already analyze it. Have you read the, the, the long simmering controversy between the Lambda architecture and the Kappa architecture? <coughs> yep. Where <laughs> Lambda was the, hey, we have the real time, or near real time here, and we have the batch here, and forever mm -hmm. they must stay separate because you, know, you can't really, mm -hmm. you can't combine them. The, the functionalities don't overlap enough. Yep. Whereas we waited it maybe a year or more and we could combine them. And what you're telling mm -hmm. us now is actually an even richer combination. Exactly. Would, would you say that, so if there was uh, Lambda, Kappa, I can't remember the next Greek <laughs> letter, but, but would you claim that next letter? Yeah, I, I think so. I think that also, uh, you know, I've been working a lot with the cloud providers. I think they also look into those uh, paradigms of how do we consolidate more and more things. You know, why do we need a caching layer, you know, like Redis, and why do we need a DynamoDB layer, you know, for why won't we, like, combine those two things together? Why can't I have my key value have cache in front of it? Okay, so, so uh, I'm in total agreement. I, by the way, I have my own blog, and I write a lot about uh, those things and the Lambda, and, uh, but this is the key challenge that we're addressing. When we go today to customers, it takes them sometimes two years from the initial POC, where they start playing with those toys, until they get everything nailed down. You know, high availability, security, versioning. And some enterprises, they don't have the skills, you know, because all the, the skills are serving the web companies. Where do they find those guys that can master those 20 something projects to create this sort of two year project? Have you bench, well, I, I guess it's hard to benchmark since you're just coming out of stealth, but what type of anecdotes have you heard in terms of time frame to go from POC to pilot to production, and then maybe have you worked at all with any design partners where you see you can benchmark a difference? Yeah, so uh, we're still really not announcing the products. I don't want to get into the, the actual uh, product, but uh, the system is designed uh, with two principles. One, it's an enterprise system. So everything is baked in. You know, we're coming from legacy of building Xtreme IO and XIV and, and uh, enterprise products, so we know how to deliver this kind of experience, you know, in-service, upgrades, all those things, one end. But what is sort of missing today is in the enterprise is this notion of service, just like Amazon. Why can you have services? I don't need the application guy to go to the IT guy and send emails and say, go provision infrastructure. I want the application guy to basically be able to provision his own uh, stuff and also be able to do application performance monitoring, you know, provision quality of service and security for more of an application paradigm. So this is what we're trying to do to simplify. Not only, you know, in the performance, uh, we could talk about what we do in performance. We sort of redesigned the entire stack to deliver phenomenal performance. But what we also believe in is that usability is the biggest thing we need to, to address. Not just complex usability performance. Usability from an admin. Like in what way? in the sense yeah. that when someone wants to provision an application or create an application, we should streamline it, you know. It needs to be the fewer amount of clicks, you know, to push it. It needs to be the fewer amount of cables to plug, you know, the fewer amount of scripts to, to write, you know. This is the, the notion I'm coming from. It's always, think about, you know, the iPhones and, and the iPads. How do you create this experience? You know, I, I wrote a blog post recently about uh, sort of the Docker, you know, and DCOS and Mesos is how do we create the apps experience for enterprise? 
And a lot of it, if you think about apps, you know, mobile apps, then the mobile apps, when you serve your uh, phone breaks, you know, you, you bring a new phone, you put your SIM card, and you start, you basically, it all works, all your apps. How did it happen? It's because all the state is stored in those sort of data services mm -hmm. somewhere in the cloud. So we need, uh, enterprise needs sort of the similar experience. Is, you know, in the future we'll have those Docker microservices delivering the apps. You know, the apps can be Spark, can be Elasticsearch, other things. We need the storage to start behaving the same way. Let me ask two questions in different directions. <laughs> Engineering is about trade-offs. Okay. You know, getting this wonderful integration has to come <coughs> at a cost. You know, what, what did you trade for that integration? <coughs> Question one, and two, is the purpose to make this the perfect storage equivalent to Spark as the unified compute um, engine? Yeah, so, so first we see the storage uh, is changing. You know, storage used to be SAN and S. You know, show me one guy deploying application in Amazon or a software as a service company using SAN or NAS. Those are going away. And, and needs to be displayed with things that are sort of stateless and elastic, like object storage, key value, you know, streaming. This is how modern applications are designed. So we want to basically address, be sort of the unified storage for this space, but we don't stop there. Because what we do, we push some of the applications, some of the analytics into our platform. Now, one of, what we did in order to address this uh, challenge, we had to redesign the entire stack. You know, think about how storage is designed today or how you know, a Cassandra would be designed today. You know, it's like a Java-based code with all the Java issues, you know, VMs, uh, garbage cleaning, and then you have traditional file systems and all that. Now, those stacks were designed 20 years ago, okay? When we had disks, when CPUs had uh, two, systems had two or four CPUs, okay? Uh, right now, we need to totally evolve the stack to think about memory, you know, we're going to have non-volatile memory right. next year with Intel 3D X point, okay, and re-RAM technology. We're going to have flash is sort of conquering storage. Why do we need to have all those disk trade-offs and scheduling when we could introduce flash at least as a caching tier, okay? Why do we need to have all this serialization in the software when we have 30 CPU cores or 40 CPU cores on the system? So basically what we had to do is bring our experience coming from high performance and trading system and, and deep security, is how do we do that in real time? And how I, do we produce basically millions of transactions per second on a single platform where current solutions are doing tens of thousands, okay? So are you saying that you used multi-core, the, the parallelism that everyone's struggling with, you assigned to each core um, or, or cores the different layers, you disaggregated the layers in the storage stack, but you kept them performant by assigning them to the cores yes. in a processor. Yeah, so That's the secret sauce. Yeah, so we're, we're coming from a rich background in real time, and for example, one of the things we did in, in Mellanox where we sort of invented uh, open um, uh, V-switch, you know, the switching in hardware, and we did things that for ne network function virtualization that produce 50 million transactions per second. You would tell a storage guy today, can you do 50 million transactions per second? It's going to faint, okay? Now, it's not that it's impossible. It's a different paradigm of how you write software, okay? It's lock-free. You have to understand how the Intel cache behaves. You have to understand how the network and the storage behaves. And most of those uh, zoo projects, as you call them, are still sort of, you know, very high level, you know, Java and all that. So we basically had to write code that doesn't use anything from the operating system. Okay, we manage the memory, we manage the interrupt, we manage everything, so we can produce latencies that are immeasurable. You know, we don't announce performance and latency numbers, but believe me, when you'll hear what we can deliver, you'll be amazed. Because we're actually faster than the block storage, you know, the fastest all flash array in the market, you know, we're faster than that. And the challenge with some of those uh, lower level storage paradigms like block or file, is that once you're starting to stack all the layers, you bring the file system and application layer, you would get 1% of your overall you know, uh, row performance. Uh, what we wanted to change is to create a stack so integrated and so, uh, so much utilizing all those different uh, capabilities, uh, so we get 90% of the overall hardware capacity. 
and that translates on one end to real real-time performance, on the other end to huge saving in cost, because what we can do on a single x86 is equivalent to about 20 different servers. Okay, so you save a bunch of power uh, consumption, all the people that need to manage it, you know, it's a huge saving. So I, d I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but if I'm reading, if I'm understanding correctly, there's a layer of services, standard services, that you could leverage, but you pay a heavy tax. Exactly. And so what you did was, you wrote those services yourself, distributed mm -hmm. it among the cores, so that they run in parallel, exactly. and that's how you eliminated the tax, went mm -hmm. parallel, and then had a revolutionary performance breakthrough. Yeah, so we serve combined technologies like uh, layer seven network processing and in-memory databases. We serve modern storage stack into one platform. Uh, you know, we do crazy things on security. We do deep packet inspection. We can analyze content on the fly in 100 gig per second throughputs. You know, there are sort of imaginary uh, numbers and performance numbers. So, and this all requires understanding of all the different layers, anywhere from the application all the way down to the, the infrastructure. And with that sort of experience, what we want to do eventually, you know, we're talking too much about the weeds and the technology, but what we want to build is a platform that sort of provides the Amazon experience to the enterprise, but with more focus on what enterprise really cares. You know, performance, security, ease of use, life cycle management, uh, simplifying it in a way that traditional enterprise guys can work with it. You know, not just sort of uh, scientists and, uh, and guys with extreme experience in software. So this is, now we have this huge advantage on the technology, because we're coming from this very rich heritage of uh, high performance enterprise product, which will allow us this sort of differentiation and allows us to basically do all this abstraction and virtualization with zero penalty, and actually resulting in faster performance. And over time, we're trying to take more and more functionality from the applications to us. So for example, we're working with ad exchange companies, okay? And they have very tough challenges of cross-correlation and things like that. And uh, we can do things on the cache layer internally that actually accelerate their applications. Uh, we had one use case where we, we can cut queries that ran uh, two days into 15 minutes by sort of trying to take uh, some of the computation, some of the state management closer to the data, you know, into a very, very optimized execution engine. Okay, so that's sort of what we're trying to do. Well, you've, you've got, uh, I think, the, certainly the makings of a better mousetrap, <laughs> and wish you all the best with that. Good luck after today's announcement. And Thank you. Thanks for Thank sharing you. that and here uh, on theCUBE. I hope to be here again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very good, all right. Sure. Thank, Thank you, Jerome, we appreciate that. Back Bye. with more from San Francisco in just a moment. Oops, sorry. <laughs>